Thank you to the CSI for hosting us in this wonderful garage space here. Um, so uh, I won't take up too much of your time because I know we have lots of great speakers today. Um, I'll start off by saying that uh, over the next year and probably even over the next six months, um, Ontario, as you know, is going to be facing a huge shift in its climate policy and in particular in its carbon pricing policy. Um, so this issue has become a very hot topic in the media and in politics as well, uh, and among policy nerds like all of us. So uh, we wanted to gather you here today to go a little bit more in depth in that and uh, answer some of your questions and uh, and help everyone kind of digest what's going on because there's, there's a lot going on right now and there's going to continue to be a lot going on. Um, just some quick logistics. So the first hour today or 45 minutes or so is going to be uh, a talk from the wonderful Dave Sawyer over here, uh, who will get a proper introduction in a minute. And uh, then we're going to take a very short break, and then we're going to have our panel discussion at 3 p.m. with our wonderful panelists, most of whom are sitting over here. Uh, and so you will get a chance for a quick break in there before the panel. And then at 4 p.m., we're going to have uh, just some appetizers and drinks, and uh, it'll be a great chance for everyone to say hi and get to know each other. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll bring up uh, Keith Brooks, who is our Program Director at uh, Environmental Defense. To say a few words. Okay, thanks, Sarah, and thanks all for coming out. Um, you know, this is a, a Clean Economy Alliance event. I don't know how many of you are members of the Clean Economy Alliance. We always have a bunch of folks that come that, that are members, but just, you know, so we all are, remember what the Alliance is. I mean, we came together back in, in 2015 when the provincial government of the day was talking about bringing out a climate change plan, talking about putting a price on carbon, and we wanted to become educated on carbon pricing. We wanted to support the government in developing climate policy. Uh, we wanted to also convene a conversation across a bunch of stakeholders. And so the, the Clean Economy Alliance comprised, you know, the cement, the cement companies. Uh, there's uh, uh, two labor unions that are, that are members here, uh, clean tech companies, health charities, environmental organizations, Federation of Agriculture, a very broad cross-section of organizations, and we had uh, a great conversation about carbon pricing that wasn't kind of um, intermediated by government. So different stakeholders really knew what each other wanted. And we got educated about carbon pricing, and we brought folks in from, from BC and from California and from Quebec and from the EU to talk about the different ways that we could put a price on carbon. And then once we were educated, we, we went through a process to try to build consensus and that was one of the first things that this alliance did, because we built consensus around carbon pricing for Ontario. We said that it you know, had to cover most of the emissions, that it needed to be a fair system, that it needed to drive towards targets, all that kind of stuff. And we put out a, a paper kind of saying, this is what we think carbon pricing. One, we support it. Two, here's what we think it should look like. Uh, what we didn't know then is that there would become this complex output-based pricing system. We didn't have the foresight to get educated on that. But now carbon pricing is changing in Ontario. And, and, and I think it's a good idea for us to become educated on, on the specifics of how this system will differ from the system that we had. And I think at the end of, of today, too, we want to uh, begin a conversation about what are we going to do with this information as the Alliance, as an organization that supported pricing and has engaged in the policy space on this. What do we want to do with the information? So just have that kind of percolating in the back of your mind as you learn today and, and have a, a great conversation. Um, so I'm going to bring up uh, my esteemed colleague here, Dale Marshall, who's our national program manager, and Dale's going to introduce Dave. That's yes. happened. Okay, and then and then we're going to get going. Afternoon, folks. Um, so I have the honor of introducing Dave. Dave and I actually go back more than a decade. Um, when I was working for a different organization, uh, he did a lot of uh, modeling work for us, looking at um, the 
price, the price on carbon, what kind of emission reduction you can get through that, uh, deep emission reductions, how to reach the targets that were being discussed at that time, um, whether natural gas was a transition fuel or not, a bunch of work that we did together going back quite a ways. Um, so it's, it's great to have, and we continue to work together, of course. Um, Dave is incredibly influential in the, in the uh, economics of climate change world. That, um, does some uh, consulting with the federal government, the Alberta government. Um, we put out, Environmental Defense put out with partners of ours, um, a report a few, um, a year and a half ago that Dave modeled um, called Mining the Gap, which um, allowed us to look at how, what kinds of policies would be needed to reach um, the targets and go beyond that we have under the Paris Agreement. Um, I won't go through everything that Dave has in his resume because it's pretty long, but he has a BA in economics in, in, at McMaster, a master's in development economics at Dow, Dalhousie. Um, he's worked for a number of um, governments and other organizations like Environment Canada, the Federal Environment Commissioner's Office. Um, he's been a VP at the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, he's now he's currently a fellow at Carleton University School of Public Policy. Um, and so I, Dave and I have discussions on a kind of regular basis. We don't always agree on every single thing, but we agree on most things. And it's always uh, very fun and informative for me to be um, to have discussions with him and to hear him speak. So love for your being here. Thank you. Thanks, Sawyer. Thanks, folks. I'm going to uh, put a timer on and just throw things at me when I get on. I'm going to grab a mic, I think. Is the mic on? Oh, yeah, that one's on. You can actually take it out. I'll take it out, okay. Of the thing. Yeah, great. And maybe we can watch a movie that I have here somewhere. Um, yeah, thank you, Dale, and thank you, folks, for arranging this. Thank you, Sarah, for liaising. Um, I really enjoyed, actually, the Mind the Gap work that we did together with uh, Environmental <coughs> Defense and, and others. Uh, Equiterre, Pembina, and Camrack. Um, it was a really interesting paper because it was sort of, hey, you know what? And then modeling exercise. What are you know? What are the knobs and dials we have to tune to the 2030 target? What does the current slate of policy look like? Uh, and, and and what does the PCF look like in terms of getting us there? And then there was a sort of this sort of extension. Well, how do we sort of ratchet it all down to go deeper and farther? Um, and I remember Dale and I had differences around offsets. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of sort of the whole toolbox, and Dale was not big on offsets. But we went back and forth quite a bit. He moved, and I moved a bit, and so it was fun. And it's always good when you have those sort of good interactions. Um, so thank you for the intro. Um, Hurricane Politicus. So I was sort of reflecting uh, in hurricane season. I mean, today I can sort of smile a little bit, uh, but maybe not tomorrow so much. Um, but, you know, when you think of carbon policy, it comes in in these waves. So when you think of the Ontario cap and trade system, that was implemented from start to finish in less than a year after a decade of just, I don't know what was going on. Um, and then when you think of the federal, the PCF, it's the exact same sort of thing. I have to think I have a scotch in my hand here, although I don't really drink anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, okay, a table. You know, I'll put it here. No, it's okay. I'll just kick it and walk around. British Columbia came out of nowhere. It was a storm surge, right? Alberta's climate leadership plan came out of nowhere, zero to 100% implementation and hardly any any time so we're having and then obviously uh, the, the Ford uh, the, the, the Ford uh, hurricane that came through and that was just came with it didn't come out of nowhere but people were sort of like well it sort of did within four months right it went from revenue neutral carbon tax for them out of the conservative platform to yeah no nothing in fact we're scrapping it all so yeah hurricanes uh, and hurricane politicus um, so that was sort of my uh, quick uh, quick observation. Um, I always like to recognize folks I work with. So I work with Chris Bataille a lot. He's um, he's now an IPCC uh, Working Group 3 author. Uh, we've done a bunch of deep decarbonization work with Seton Stevert and Jonathan Peters of Navius does a lot of the modeling. So carbon policy is complex. It's hard to get your head around. You really, as an individual, can't understand all of it. And you really have to reach out and build coalitions of smart people to figure stuff out. Um, so that's the way I sort of view it. Um, so I'll start out a little boring and then move a little more interesting, maybe. So, I mean, I really sort of, what it, the question was, what are the economic and emission implications of the federal backstop applied in Ontario? Um, and then the first question, well, will it 
we implement it. We all have views on this, right? This, we, we, all, we all read the paper, we're all active in the space. But I think the really interesting point here is A, a the political class, and, and, and including today, Minister McKenna said she doubled down. That was, that was the, 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 the CP uh, article today I read on the, on the train. Um, she doubled down on, on Saskatchewan, but yeah, we're implementing it. 2019 is coming. Um, they keep talking about Ontario. Um, and then the Prime Minister talked about, eh, we're going to maybe revisit, we're going to take a look uh, at, at Manitoba down the road, because Manitoba has this $25 flat um, uh, price trajectory. And then, East, you know, are they serious? Well, Environment, Climate, ECCC, Environment and Climate Change Canada, is really busy on levy design, output-based pricing, and over-consultation. A bunch of you in the room are probably being over-consulted uh, and can't keep, keep up on the initiatives. Um, Dale, I think later we just had a quick chat. Maybe you could chat a bit about what you guys are engaged in because it's, you know, there's a whole lot going on, obviously. Uh, and then the schedules is Gazette one to fall 2018, so that's a fully defined regulatory proposal to be gazetted uh, with regulatory impact analysis and draft regs this quarter. Really? Okay. We shall we shall see. Uh, and going to Gazette two hopefully before the election in uh, in 2019. Um, so a uh, really rapid looking uh, uh, regulatory agenda. Um, and then, so what does it look like? Uh, you know, so I think it's, it's you know, what does the transition look like from Ontario to uh, the Ontario system, current system, uh, to the, I actually said the other day, the old system. Uh, it was really weird. And I said the old Ontario policy, which was a year old. It's old already. Um, so obviously, you know, the, the federal system has a much higher carbon price. We'll talk a bit about that. Um, talk about recycling back to households. Keith and I were just talking about that. It's very unclear actually what's going to go on with all this revenue, except it's all going to go back to households. That's got some very different implications in the current Ontario system from a competitiveness perspective, uh, tech environment, uh, you know, distributional impact, all, kind of, all kinds of stuff. Uh, how you recycle the money really impacts distributional impacts uh, of the policy. And then this output based pricing. I'm going to bore you with some re I'm actually going to put some math at one point, just towards the end when you're half asleep, and I'll put you to sleep even further just before cocktails. Um, but we're going to talk a bit about the output based pricing system who's in, who's out, 50,000 kilotons uh, as a threshold for emitters, very different from the 25,000 kilotons in, in Ontario. And then there's 10,000K opt in, so <laughs> folks can come in. And then electricity likely included, which is a big shift for, for Ontario. Obviously, electricity under the cap and trade system was a downstream entity not regulated. They were just getting flow through costs uh, to, to them through their energy pricing, through their natural gas pricing, basically. Um, they would become a regulated entity, uh, it looks like, under, under the federal system. Okay, so that's sort of the quick overview. Um, okay, so whenever I do modeling, I like to say this. This is my favorite thing. Apologies, folks, you've seen this before, but this is... I sat by you two ladies in the coffee shop. You're talking Caribbean waste stuff. Yeah. I'm often a garbage economist. I'm actually more proud of being a garbage economist, but that's another story. I wasn't just dropping. I was like, I heard Caribbean. I was like, who doesn't Caribbean? I'm like, what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, smiling. Okay, so Harry Potter scenarios at work. So we're modeling climate policy out to 2050. The modeling is wrong. Absolutely wrong. We don't know GDP next week. We don't know, roughly, we don't know GDP next week. We don't know oil prices have closed the business today. Sure, we have futures contracts, but it really, you know, it doesn't really help. So whenever I say we're doing this modeling analysis, I like to call it Harry Potter scenarios. You wave your magic wand in the models and say expect to be carbonous and expect to be politicus. And often we suspend economics around technology deployment, right? Let's put hydrogen fuel cells everywhere. Um, so, you know, so you got to sort of take it with a grain of salt. So that's my caveat, but learning is important. The modeling does help people learn. In fact, the point I had about talking about with Dale. Um, okay, so when I think of where Ontario is in the grand scheme of, of the NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution for Canada, we've done a bunch of modeling on deep decarbonization and sort of saying, okay, how do we get there? Can we turn those knobs and dials to basically get to the red circle, which is, which is our NDC? Uh, and then we have these different trajectory paths, fast and slow, uh, et cetera, 1.5 to DC. When you're getting into these levels by 2050, I mean, you're down to, you know, one ton per capita, two tons per capita, down from 70 in Alberta. So fundamental shift in, 
in, in well, the energy economy entirely. And, and when you think about this transition, you think about capital stock turnover, this building will be operating then. These LED lights are probably operating in 10, 15 years if they yeah, don't burn out like some of mine do. They're just supposed to last 10 years. Um, but you know, capital stock turnover matters, and so we're sort of locked into this capital. And you think about 2050, it's sort of two or three cars, the life of two or three cars. It's the life of one or two furnaces or three furnaces. Um, so, you know, it's a really rapid transition. Um, okay, so where are we now? So before the before the, the 2016 the Liberals came in with the Canadian framework, we basically had this gap under the Harper government that was massive, right? We, emissions were, were coming down primarily because of the oil price shocks. Uh, and the forecast of lower oil prices that we saw. So we saw less uh, less emissions coming in Alberta, but also Saskatchewan. Um, and then we had this sort of large gap. Uh, and then along comes the PCF, uh, and this is the federal floor, so this is for the federal uh, um, uh, uh, carbon levy, so the carbon pricing system. So when this is applied to the non-carbon pricing jurisdictions, Ontario's not in I'll show you Ontario in a second. Um, because we assume the WCI would, would qualify for no back, you know, Ontario would not be a backstop jurisdiction under the Canadian framework. Um, so, you know, this is sort of picking up Saskatchewan, the Atlantic region, Manitoba. So not a big really change in emissions because at the time Alberta had a program and most of the large economy, you know, 80% of the economy or 70 change percent of the economy had carbon pricing. So not a big impact. Um, and then along comes Quebec and Ontario. So this is sort of cheering up to the 2030 target, uh, their targets, combination of carbon pricing, action plan spending, offsets, WCI imports, the whole sort of kitchen sink, 83 megatons, doing some significant lifting for the rest of the country towards the NDC. Um, and this is some of the work that we, we this is the work I referenced earlier uh, uh, for, for Dale and, and, and the folks. So Ontario and Quebec were doing quite a bit, and we found actually that this number, the, the, this reduction dropped the national carbon price about 50 bucks. That it made it easier for everybody else to hit their targets. So you didn't have to do heavy lifting in Alberta, for example, or PEI, the big emitter PEI. Um, and so nationally, the carbon price was 50 bucks lower, and we also had a pretty aggressive regulatory package uh, operating in the background as well. So sort of policy interactions and all that sort of thing. So some heavy lifting going on. And then along comes the PCF, there's HFC regulations, there's uh, there's a clean fuel standard, uh, there's, what else in there, Dale, there's uh, my husband, there's a bunch of stuff. Methane, yeah, of course, the methane regulations, which is a big reduction, right? So you're fixing the methane reductions, fixed base year 2012, 50% or 45% reduction from there, whatever the number turns out to be, but you've got growing methane regulations, which are about half of oil and gas, all of oil and gas emissions. So potentially a really, really, really big uh, source of reductions. Um, so that, you know, we're about 30 megatons was the gap at the time. Um, and this sort of corresponded to what Environment Canada was thinking. This has since changed the latest update to about 60 megatons. And that was, excuse me, changes in oil and gas emissions. But you know, I think plus or minus 100% of these gaps up to 2030 is actually a pretty good pair of our um, the uncertainty on these emission forecasts for Environment Canada about 120 megatons if you look at the high and low scenarios. So a doubling of 29 to 60 megatons is not actually a big deal, well within their published sensitivities. Um, okay, and here's Doug Ford. So this is what happens when, with Ontario coming out of basically uh, PCF, uh, sorry, excuse me, out of the cap and trade program. Uh, and then the federal backstop kicking in. So this is by 2030, the federal carbon price at 50 bucks eroding in real terms because it's not indexed to inflation, so it's only worth about $60, $36, excuse me, 50 to about 36 out of 2020, so not indexed to inflation. Uh, and, and so you get a bunch of emission reductions, but you don't get as much as you would have under Ontario. So you're looking at about a 20 to a 30 megaton change uh, with, with this move by, uh, by, by uh, the Ontario government. So that's some of the sort of quick background on on sort of that's a sort of big picture stuff. Now I'm going to jump into the weeds a little bit and maybe really put this sleep. Okay, so what does uh, the federal backstop look like compared to the Ontario uh, regulations, the cap and trade regs? Well, the half pie chart there on the left um, really is industrial process emissions that represent in the top right corner the 82 to 72 percent coverage, right? So you have industrial process emissions. 
versus combustion emissions on a 2020 forecast is about 165 megatons. Again, this jumps up and down. Every document you look at from either Environment Canada myself or anybody else, that number jumps around a bit. Don't get too hung up on that, I think, unless there are major shifts, you gotta ask why. Um, there's all kinds of reasons why that number jumps around. Mistakes, for example. Um, okay, so that's the difference. So we have covered versus not covered industrial process emissions. Ag and waste were always out. Regulations covering waste in Ontario. Ag was desk, ag and land use, probably a, you probably get an offset system operating there. But really, that's the difference in this coverage number. Um, I think more importantly, more interestingly, on this cap and trade and the large final emitters program, you're talking about 110, 150 facilities that met a 25,000 kiloton threshold, uh, 32 megatons of emissions in 2016 from the latest inventory online. Um, and the, the three allocations of that 36 was about tw uh, 32, was about 26 megatons. Is the portion that was free. So for the large final emitters, emitters, the price emissions were basically six megatons and the rest 26 were allocated, give or take, were allocated for free. So so, so so yeah, so that, that's how the free allocations of the program works. Under output, federal output based pricing, a different threshold um, and you get about 32 megatons, 92 facilities. So you get rid of a lot of small facilities like food companies, uh, for example. Um, but interesting, electricity is likely gets added in, which is seven megatons, uh, and this is falling, well, it was falling with carbon policy in place and, and renewable policy in place. We'll see where that number goes. We've got about 25 additional facilities in the 92. Interestingly, more emissions because of these, because of uh, electricity, but what's going on uh, with the like. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so coverage looks roughly the same, not quite. Uh, and then the treatment of the large final emitters looks a little, a little different, but obviously the price is very different. Dave, that's just Ontario numbers? Yeah, that's just Ontario. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, so I start, sorry, I started with a federal sort of overview to contextualize Ontario, that 23 megatons sort of in, uh, loss in emission reductions with the Ontario program dissolving, cap and trade and, and the climate action plan, offsets, et cetera. Uh, and then now I'm just going to punch down into uh, sort of Ontario and say, okay, what's going on? And then I'm going to really bore you with output based pricing. Or myself, but it's sometimes like, why am I working on this? Okay. Um, so the carbon price. So we all know the carbon price trajectory. Um, this is an index of the carbon price versus the WCI sort of uh, auction price we see now for the vintages out to 2021, 20, 2022. So we don't have to forecast the short term WCI prices, we just go to the latest auction. Look for settlement price, Canadian dollars, there it is. And then this is compared against the federal federal price. And basically, I mean, we see a, a, a 1.5 and a 2x in 2020, 2022, an increase in the carbon price, right? So that right away is gonna drive more emission reductions in the modeling real world, the gets wrong, real world, who knows what's going on. So this is basically what, what, what the forecast, excuse me, the modeling looks like to 2022. So we have a no policy uh, reference case at the top. We have the cap and trade price to 163.1. And then the federal price goes to there, this is 2022. And then the climate action plan, and then the true ups to the targets. Uh, the offsets, WCI imports made, made up this big difference. So this is really what you're losing. This is really what we're losing. And just notice over here, this 120 megatons, right? So this this actually looks really small when the you know when you're actually at zero. So just uh, just so we can see it, this is at 120. So these numbers aren't that massive on a you know on a hundred. You know you're, you're talking about five megatons and 170 megaton uh, forecast. Um, but this is a fairly large number, and then that gets larger in time. So that's the uh, that's the emission reductions we get. So we get we get more carbon pricing emissions, but less with the demise of the action plan. You know, intuitive. I, I think about cumulative emissions and carbon budgets. Um, so these are cumulative emission reductions in time because we have you know sometimes this is the the trick with the Manitoba work. Uh, Manitoba has a flat carbon price of 25 bucks. When you run the $10 through $50 through a model of, of uh, Manitoba, it looks very similar in terms of emission reductions to a $25 flat 
Start, start higher, level off, start low, ramp up. Politically in Manitoba, they thought they could get away with 25 bucks a ton. The cumulative emission reductions that you get to 2022, actually the $25 delivered more because we had that price starting in 2018, driving more emission reductions. Um, and Environment Canada sort of gradually looked at it and said, okay, we'll take a look at that later. So anyway, I care about cumulative emission reductions, not necessarily 20, 30 targets uh, as much. So here's what we have for, for cumulative emission reductions. So here's a cap and trade uh, from the carbon price, and here, here's the reductions coming out of the, uh, the cumulative reductions coming out of the action plan, Ontario, and national offsets, and then WCI reports. It was always unclear. I mean, this is where the Auditor General got it wrong in Ontario, and I sent a letter to them and complained formally about it. But they just said, oh, this whole gap is going to be made up, to be made up of WCI and CI reports. They found a deck that we had put together two years ago internally, uh, and they just ran with it when, in fact, you know, later on, they're like, oh, we're just assuming WCI imports as backstop because we don't know what the offset program looks like. We don't know what CCAP is delivering. Let's just assume imports, worst case scenario. And so they ran with this big thing. And anyway, it was, they never checked with us. It was, it was a, yeah, anyway. Can I ask yeah. a, a yeah. quick question about that? Is that yeah. the... The quote you always hear about the money all flowing to California yeah. is, is that sort of a misinterpretation of it's an it's an outright I, I would actually say it was purposely done politically because because we had we had yeah I it was it was a choice because we there we had time we had one deck like that we had like 30 decks that had this list in it mm -hmm. yeah and we didn't know in fact subsequent modeling we found that the revenue recycling with the CCA lead was delivering a ton of reductions, way more than we thought, um, once it got uh, designed up, so that the WCI imports dropped significantly. And then we added Canadian offsets, again, uh, because they're typically at a discount to the market price. So anyway, but the, the, the point was, we don't know, we're not sure, let's just, let's just sort of group it together and say, okay, that's the gap to the target. Do we have the plans and, 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 and resources in place to deliver on these? Well, yeah, check. You're going to jump in over here? No? Okay. We can jump, we can, yeah, we can, we can talk when we want. When we want. Um, okay, total compliance tons, cap and trade, and, and the action plan were here, and the federal, and here's the, so this is total compliance tons. Um, so these aren't necessarily emission reductions, because you may not believe, as you read the press, that WCI imports out of California are real emission reductions. So be really careful when you talk about emission reductions. I say here reduced to really compliance tons. Um, so that's sort of the difference. So a big difference in cumulative, uh, cumulative times reduced over the over the period. So those are the emission reductions. Any thoughts, questions? Uh, okay. So revenue. Well, you know, we know, you know, we know these numbers. It's not that hard to take a look at the inventory, to take a look at coverage for the for the two policies, the uh, uh, Ontario cap and trade versus the federal benchmark. Apply the carbon price. Um, the models are just a little more, you know, they capture some interactions. Tax, you know, income taxes are rising because there's maybe more or less consumption or income taxes are falling or rising depending on what's going on. Sales taxes, HST is falling or rising. So the models pick up these sort of interactions. But basically, the net revenue impacts uh, are quite significant uh, for uh, between the two programs. It's all a carbon price, right? It's all a carbon price. Uh, and then the question is, what do you do with it? What do you do with that revenue? So that was sort of the difference uh, from the modeling between the two policies. And interestingly, the GDP impacts were really small between the scenarios, like really small impacts. And it's no big surprise we saw this during the cap and trade design program. In fact, charts like this really helped the bureaucracy and the political class in Ontario drive the cap and trade program forward. Uh, and th these sort of numbers are coming out of a few different sources. Um, and so you have very little difference in, in, in the impact. Here's the reference case. This is the size of the economy uh, from 2017 to 2023. So I like to use these sort of indexes because when we look at growth rates, oh, growth rates negative 0.02%. Well, hang on, the economy is growing at 2% a year and we just lost 0.02% and we really slowed the economy. So it, it gives you this false sky is falling sort of bit. Now, this, of course, masks some sectoral impacts that can be pretty significant. Um, so although the total economy may not be changing, if you're taking all this revenue away from 
uh, uh, light industry and giving it to households, you're going to have some big distributional impacts uh, in, in the fact that you're fully pricing uh, carbon uh, in you know in the in light manufacturing, and you're getting no no proceeds back, and you're getting you're concentrating all that money over somewhere else uh, in households. So it's a Peter and Paul sort of story about Peter and Paul. Um, and so some of the work that went on that sort of showed how you carve up the revenue and how it impacts distribution and fundamentally impacted the design of the cap and trade system material. And in fact, it moved. So an initial thinking around giving giving it all to transit, to the sort of mixed use climate action plan that we ended up with, where okay, the rule was not the rule, the guidance was, if households pay this much, they get back this much in programmatic spending. Light industry, LFE. So that's and that and charts around the distributional impacts really sort of helped some of the thinking uh, around that and like oh okay, this is not exactly what we want to do. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so households. I think what's really interesting about households, so this is, this is sort of the 22, uh, 2022 impacts under cap and trade for three income groups. You can do more income groups, but basically low income, mine below 20, high income above, above 150, and then average income 60 to 80. Average income Ontario is about 70 to 75,000 a year. So this is your average household. These are the impacts on the household. You can basically take energy profiles and build these up from Statistics Canada data. It's not that hard to do in a spreadsheet. And you can basically figure out their consumption costs, our consumption costs. So what do we spend on non-energy goods and services? Uh, and then you can figure out, again, through Statistics Canada data, um, the emission intensity of those purchases of the food sector in Canada. Of consumption. So you can sort of figure this stuff out. So that's where this comes from. And then we basically, this 299 I have here, we just take all the household revenue that we forecast and we, and we give it all to households. Now this is a bad scenario from a competitiveness perspective, a really good scenario from a household perspective if you did this, um, and uh, politically saleable. This is what we're hearing right now, the shift towards, oh, I'll give it all to households. Again, this Peter and Paul story rings really true here. Maybe politically salient, but you're doubling down some of your competitiveness impacts. So it was unclear in Ontario under the cap and trade system what household would get back. You know, not everybody was getting uh, uh, retrofit dollars. So that's the difference I think with this new federal system. And so that was sort of you know, and we see, and this is this is like Alberta. Alberta has these very similar numbers. Average households were better off when, when Chuck's checks were cut initially um, by Alberta government. So here's the federal plan. Very different expenditures in 2022 at 50 bucks. Uh, these are on a sort of uh, dollar for dollar comparison. So these are both in real terms, real dollars. So there's no, yeah, they're, they're, they're comparable is all I'm saying with these, with these estimates. Um, and, and you can see, you know, so the worst off households, $300. Um, not that big a number. Right? We're actually we're hearing a lot of, uh, from conservative politicians right now about they're you know, twelve hundred dollars a household, fifteen hundred dollars a household. Well, that's if you add this and this, and you actually don't do the math properly. It looks really large, uh, but if you start giving the money back, as the feds have said, we have a very. You know, in fact, this was in this income. This was the only group that's paying. paying. I think the over hundred thousand paid a little bit as well. Um, so this is what the federal system looks like. It all goes to households. Uh, and so some significant differences, but I think not as significant as we're seeing represented in the press. Uh, and in fact, many households are better off. Uh, you know, if, if, if you know, this is the sort of fee and dividend scenario when you think about it. I'm sorry, you're saying the fee and dividend scenario is better for households? Uh, your fee and dividend is absolutely better for households because you're giving, although they pay, say, Say their emissions and their payments are 40% of all revenue. You have heavy industry and light manufacturing and transport fuels. You're taking all the money from the non-households and giving it to households. And then, so what you're doing is you're doubling down on competitiveness because you're not only hammering with the carbon price, you're not giving it any, any of it back to reduce the income hit. You're taking it away and giving it to households. So politically saleable, but whenever we run the <laughs> this sort of scenario of a macroeconomic model, it's called the lump sum in the literature, you get the worst impacts. What kind of worst impacts are 
closet be the least. Uh, the com worst competitiveness impacts. Worst yeah, competitive. and it has very little impact on emissions. Very little, because your carbon price is driving your emissions. Um, yeah, your carbon price drives your emissions. In the longer term, you're going to fail. And this is, you know, Dale and I have had these conversations a few times, and, and most uh, folks who are environmentally, really environmentally inclined, um, like to think about, well, we shouldn't give any of it back to, to businesses because if we give it back, we're actually sort of locking in that high emitting capital. So, so hang on, we give them the carbon price, 50 bucks, causes abatement choices, and those abatement choices have value because, and on all emissions because, oh, it's a carbon price and I want to avoid paying it. So, okay, I'll make those decisions. But then I get some money back from the government and my balance sheet's a little better off. So it's a balance sheet impact versus a mitigation impact. And the recycling drives the balance sheet which then drives capital deployment, and the marginal cost of the carbon price drives technology choice around abatement. So whenever you think about the, you know, this Alberta system, folks didn't like Alberta system because yes, abatement was was priced at 15 bucks a ton, and every ton reduced was was saleable, tradable at 15 bucks a ton. Really, the effective price, the average price, was two bucks, and I'm going to keep running my facility. It wasn't 15 bucks uh, on the balance sheet. So there's, yeah, if you look, you do one thing, look online about marginal versus average pricing and carbon pricing, get your head around that, it's an important point. Question, yeah. I was thinking about taxes. Um, so two scenarios, right? So 1200 bucks comes from light industrial and goes to households. Yeah. Light industrial, more likely gets a tax break on that. Um, not sure if that's taxable income or not to the household right. or not. Um, so if it's not, or if it is taxable income, a household spends money on retrofits, they're not going to get a tax break on that. Right. So more taxes are paid, I guess, right? Right, because they're not going to be able to deduct yeah. money that's there. So it's we're actually going to get less of an impact right. with the, uh, the money being in the household's hands because they can't actually write off the, uh, the reduction. How long have I been chatting? Uh, I think you've got another like five minutes or so, five and then we'll get oh, into questions. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Right. right. So, 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 because of income tax, so, yeah, you don't get as much bang for a buck because it's in in the hands of someone yeah. who can't write off. Um, right. The, the, the industry will complain. Oh my God! This and they'll tell you this is going to cost me X. Well, no, no, you can write 25% off of that because it's your average price. But cost impact is lower. Well. So the work we do, we've been doing for Alberta and the Feds on on sort of in Ontario for for facility level impacts, industrial facility level impacts, we have a tax and royalty interaction where we net out that cost. So it's never, oh, this is 50 bucks a ton on all our emissions. No, no, your, your emissions, how, wait, how, how much are your emissions priced? Oh, this much. And you've got a tax right off, and oh, maybe you can pass those costs on as well if you're an electricity producer. If you're a steel producer, maybe not, but sometimes you have a contract where you can flow stuff through, so it's really unclear what you can pass on and how much. So yeah, that's a good point. It's never as simple as carbon price times emissions. It's way more uh, into the weeds than that. Okay, output-based pricing. You can turn it off your mind here a little bit now. Um, okay, so what is output-based pricing? So output-based pricing is basically, and it's an emission rate level. Um, well, let me back up. It's not a it's not a compliance regime. It's just a way to price less emissions to reduce the average cost or the income hit or the balance sheet impact on the facility. So you have this you have this carbon price that drives abatement, but then we're not actually, and we're going to sort of incent you to make investments, and every ton is going to be valued through that carbon price to make emission reductions, but we're, we're actually not going to sort of charge you on all your emissions so that you're paying on all your emissions, so your, your average cost of the policy is lower than the marginal cost. Um, so all you're doing here is you're pricing a fraction of emissions and maintaining the incentive to abate. Um, so, so it's very similar to the free allocations that happened in Ontario, uh, tech, tech subsidies through through the, the, the CCAP, the, the Action Plan Ontario, income tax reductions, border carbon adjustments. It's just another sort of tool. Um, and what is it? It's an, it's an intensity rate. So if we look at if we look at facilities here, these are these are generating units in Alberta, real data. Coal plants, cogeneration plants, combined and single cycle plants. We have an emission rate like the federal government has. Uh, this was a rate that, uh, that Alberta was looking at, 0.4 tons per, so it's emissions per unit of output. Emissions per unit of output can be per ton of cement. We figure out where the facilities are. We basically draw a line, and if you're above the line, you owe us. If you're below the line, you're crediting. 
Okay, and then this line basically you can go up and down. So you can specify these emission intensities, which is sort of uh, tons of production over megawatt hours through data. Somehow you have the data together, and then this emission rate goes up and down. And basically, depending on where you are, it sets whether you owe or whether you're crediting. Um, and if you can't meet it, you owe tons, and you got to make emission reductions. If you exceed it, you can sell your your credits that you have, but you can also make additional emission reductions if you can and sell those as well. Those folks can't do anything up there. So that's roughly what it looks like. Now we get into the really boring bits. Oh no, this is, yeah, I'm not gonna talk about this too much. Why do we do output-based pricing really quickly? So output-based pricing, because of this average versus marginal cost effect I talked about, output-based pricing basically, so this is a carbon price here. These are two, uh, these are two uh, megaton trajectories. Here's the output-based pricing. Here's the full auction. You basically maintain a little more production because that average cost I talked about, that balance sheet impact is less than the carbon price because you're only pricing a fraction of emissions. So these are two scenarios. Here's a rising carbon price. Okay, it doesn't look great. Again, 620 megatons over there, you know, it's not zero. So this maybe isn't that big. But the really big impact is down here on GDP. Um, so there's a difference in tons. Uh, but here's the impact in GDP, the size of the economy. Um, and so with, with the hybrid output-based pricing like we have in Alberta, like Ontario already had, I'll talk about that in a second, um, we basically were maintaining economic, you know, these are the growth rates in the economy, these are the sizes of the total economy under the two scenarios. And the reason we have output-based pricing in Canada, coast to coast really, uh, is because of this it sort of really helps emission intensive trade exposed folks by giving, not pricing all their emissions and basically helping them out in the balance sheet. So that, that explains sort of why we're doing it. How are we doing it? So this, this is Ontario's allocation methodology, similar to California. Uh, Alberta has something similar. So what does this mean? So this is basically, and let me back up, the Ontario Cap and Trade Program. So 40 to 50% of the LFP uh, tons, which is I think 32 megatons I had in the beginning, Half of it was under an output-based pricing benchmark already. So it's really not that big a shift for Ontario, although the stringency is very different with the carbon price and where you set this benchmark rate, that level I talked about, where you set it, very different in Ontario. So steel, cement, lime, and refining had it, 40 to 50 percent of emissions. A is a transitional assistance factor. Oh, you're an LFB, so you're going to get, effectively in Ontario, this was one depending on your, your EITE, Emission Intensive Trade Exposure Rating, basically do you meet some thresholds, like in Alberta, Alberta uses it, thresholds in, uh, in Europe, um, California, uh, and ideally in time you, you take this down as industry transitions to lower carbon operations and other, other jurisdictions catch up with carbon pricing, A goes from 1 to 0.75 to 5, Full auction, it would be zero if you take this all away and you get no break on your emissions. B is this benchmark rate I talked about over here. I'll jump into that and C is this cap decline factor and type rate. How fast this ratchets down towards the 2030 target, 3.57% for industrial facilities in Ontario. So this is the ABC of benchmarks. Uh, what, okay, here, so close your eyes if you hate Greek. Oh my God, what is this? Um, okay, so this is the OBA factor. This is actually fairly straightforward. So this is your emission intensity. So the, your B factor, which basically sets how many how many free allocations you get or free emissions you get, is just a function of your emission intensity. So your emission intensity is simply your simply your covered GHGs. So say your combustion GHGs for your product, electricity, ethanol, lime, over your production of that product. So, and the, OB, and, the, the, and the U is the, is the OBA rate, that 0.4 I talked about over here that slides up and down. So if you think about it, here at 0.6, this is 0.4, U of 0.2 times production. Okay, and then, so this is how, and then for each product you produce, say your multi-product facility like a chemical plant, you would have ethylene, styrene. In Alberta, they have heat, hydrogen, uh, electricity, and they all sort of add, add up. In Ontario's cap and trade system, you basically just got you, you basically just got this. This didn't disappear. You got all you basically got sort of all the emissions at the benchmark and any difference you had to make up on your own. 
Under the Alberta and the federal system, you're actually only getting a little bit of this minus this. So think about this if you're getting 0.2 instead of 0.4. So you're getting a smaller sort of fraction. Um, so the different big difference of the output based pricing system at the national level over Ontario is this you get sort of most of your emissions covered. Here you have a small compliance obligation that you have to, have to make up, which is a function of those two things. And then, yeah, we'll get into that. That wasn't too bad, I hope. Okay, here's where, okay, I think this is the last slide. Yeah, last slide. Okay, so how does the output based pricing system work? So just a quick, quick overview. So these, so these are all facilities, and this is their emission intensity. So that's all these are. So these are just a spread. And that represents those sort of oil, uh, coal and natural gas facilities I talked about. So, this, so there's a really bad performer, there's a top performer. So that's the first thing you want to look at there. Um, the next thing uh, we're going to look at here is these are total compliance payments. So these are total payments that are paid out for all the facilities into a government over here. And then what we're looking at over here, this is a sales test. So this sales test is basically saying, okay, what are your compliance payments over your total sales? So you can think of it as sort of your carbon cost per household, 400 bucks over 70,000. I'm almost done, two seconds. Uh, and so these are the sales tests. And these sales tests are being applied in Alberta, they're used in Ontario on a facility and, and, and the feds now on a facility by facility basis to say, okay, for the different benchmarks, and here are the benchmarks. So here's the opening federal 70% stringent. For the opening benchmarks, what's the range of impact on the sales ratio for facilities? Typically, 2 to 3% is a big impact. 8% is a massive impact. Um, and so we can see as we move the benchmark over, the big kerfuffle we just read about in the paper with the feds moving from a 70 to a 90 or 70 to an 80% was around moving this benchmark, the OBA level over. So basically, if the average, and what is this benchmark? If the average uh, for the facilities is 0.4, we're going to set this at 90% of 0.4 or 70% of 0.4. And so it just sort of moves your compliance obligation over a little bit. And depending on what your facilities look like, there are some winners and losers. So over here, we go from everybody paying to here, we get some people who are accrediting. And over here, you know, at 100%, it's all emissions are, are given out. You know, there's no sort of no net, net impact. Um, and depending on what the spread of facilities looks like, these, these charts can look very differently. But anyway, that's how you think about open face pricing. Though. You've got distribution of facilities, you set a benchmarks related to some sort of to their emission intensity, and then you move the benchmark around and you assess the impact. And governments care about revenue, so that's why we go there. Uh, last slide. Okay. No, I think we've stopped. I'll just leave that up. You guys can read that. We got time for a couple questions. All right. Questions. I have a question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, an initial consideration where in Ontario it sounded like they were thinking of putting all of the revenues from half and trade into into transit. Yeah. Was that, uh, was that I guess I, I didn't live here then, I missed that. Can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah, so so there was a you know government government so the wind government had a, a pro transit agenda. Mm -hmm have to finance it somehow, well, let's take the cap and trade money like California did and put it into transit. To be 100% of it going into yeah, transit. Yeah, or some big number of it. If you take some economic models, like if you use economic impact multipliers you hear about, so these multipliers say, oh, if you put a buck here, you generate four jobs. Woo! We like jobs as politicians. If you run that model through the carbon proceeds, the highest economic impact multiplier in Ontario is con are construction jobs. So you're creating jobs with transit. If you run that scenario through the models, the more integrated models that capture costs and productivity impacts and concentrating proceeds, um, you have a very different outcome. The transit actually looks really bad because you're giving all this money, you're taking all this money, that you, you're hammering balance sheets really hard and giving you the transit. So that, so that they looked at and said, oh, well, let's do transit, but let's, let's be a little more measured. Hi, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, Saskatchewan and Ontario were on shaky ground for the court challenge. Right. Could you <clears throat> expand upon that a little bit? Not a constitutional scholar. Um, Natalie Charlebois from the University of Ottawa wrote a brilliant paper about two years ago. Um, since then, sort of looked at, and yeah, yeah, and you know, there's some court, you know, 
uh, Supreme Court cases that say uh, the veteran can go. So, again, somebody in the room probably, I know, has a much better view on this than I do. Don't ask the economist a legal question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so your point about recycling the revenue into programs being better than just putting it in households, I, I totally understand. But I was having this discussion recently with a friend who said, look, if Ontario had put it into the pockets of households, uh, it probably would still be here today. What do you say to that argument? Uh, so, okay, I'm going to sidestep that one. So when the Waxman-Markey bill came out, which is American Clean Energy Security Act 2009, one of the last major U.S. initiatives to, to uh, have national carbon pricing in the U.S., the bill was about this big. The revenue recycling section was this big. Fight, fight, fight over the money. So from, an econ from my perspective, from an economics perspective, um, if you like emission reductions, give it to, give it, give it to rebate programs, subsidies. If you like economic, you know, if you like economic efficiency, reduce taxes. Politically salient, cut checks to households, and they all have different implications. Um, and I get, I get the drive right now to throw it all at households, but I, I think it's not politically uh, resilient because you're going to see competitiveness impacts intensify. But I don't understand it. <laughs> um, so, well, typically, um, so the output, when we when we take the money out of sectors that they pay in and, and, and don't give it back, uh, that scenario, the GDP, the gross output, the employment, the stuff, the nefarious turn competitiveness, whatever you hang under that, because it's hard to nail down what competitiveness actually is, you can sort of define it. Um, when, you, when you look at those indicators, output, GDP, employment, they're worse off when you take that, when you don't give any of the money back to the folks who paid for it, and in particular the business. So giving money back is good for the jobs and other things that you're saying? Yeah, I, I like the, I liked Ontario balance, uh, Ontario's balanced approach, which was if households paid 30 million or whatever the number was, they get roughly back that in programmatic spending or tax breaks. Can I ask you one more question? You, you read the book, The Case of the Credit Nope. Yes. Well, in that book, the, the authors of this book, the, the, um, uh, the idea there was that because you're increasing the price every year, yeah. uh, it's going up and it's a lot of money. Yeah. Start by giving the money back to people. You give them all the money in the first year yeah. because you want them to like adjust, right? And to like and to keep and yeah. not to do what's just happening on a period of addiction, right? Yeah. So then, with a lot of money, they can work every year. Here, you can start diverting some to split it yeah. and send some back. You can keep sending that same amount or more back to households yeah. and put some into programs. What have you heard that idea? What do you think of that? Uh, yeah, I get well, so I lived to Alberta. So Alberta kind of checks everybody initially, big checks showing up, and how's people not be doing with that? So those who don't like, don't, don't, don't like do the policy. <laughs> We're going to have a discussion with the panel about okay. the, the political aspects yeah. and all that kind of stuff, the environmental aspects. So I think if you have questions for Dave on the technical side of things, we should do that. Otherwise, we'll go to the panel. Yeah. Let's go, okay, one more and we'll go to the panel because I've talked enough. I just want to ask, when you talk about taking uh, the money and giving it back to the sector, yeah. is that like with, to invest in reductions or is it just back to the sector? Lots of choices. So you can reduce corporate income taxes. Industry doesn't like it because they don't pay very much corporate income tax. And you actually swamp that income tax out really quick because as the carbon price rises, taxes are so low at the corporate level typically that you run out of room to go. So you can you can reduce it corporately like that, or you can give it back like Ontario did for programs like the cement sector, for example. Um, yeah. Yeah. Again, these are the choices. They have, they typically have very little impact on emission reductions. Very little impact. In the longer term, the subsidy programs work absolutely. They deliver more reductions, but it's the carbon price that does the heavy lifting. As long as you got that good, strong, rising carbon price, you get your reductions, and then you're playing a little bit on reductions with the way you recycle. Yeah. All right. So we're going to. Uh, Dave is going to be on our panel. Just FYI, everyone, so you'll have more chance to throw lots of questions at him. 
Um, and at the end of our panel, we're going to take more audience questions as well as questions uh, for anybody who's on the webinar. Uh, you can type them into your little questions panel on there uh, towards the end of, uh, of our panel discussion. We're going to take a quick like, five-minute break. Uh, you can head to the washroom if you need to. Uh, the CSI cafe is open as well. I'm to grab anything there. Uh, and can also chit-chat.
natural hut has fallen over the room, so probably a good time to uh, to kick off. Before we actually um, before we actually ask our panelists any questions, uh, I wanted to start with a polling question for the audience, and I'm going to try my best at counting the number of people who say yes and the number of people who say no, uh, but feel free to help me with that. Uh, so the poll question is. Will the federal price on carbon, as it's currently proposed, so starting at $20 a ton and ratcheting up, uh, as it's currently proposed, will it lead to significant behavior change to reduce emissions? So, on the yes side, one, two, three, four, Jamie, okay, five, okay, and no, it will not lead to significant behavior change. Or <laughs> oh, I think the no's have it here. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, okay, and anybody dead in the middle? I don't know yet. I've got to wait and see. <laughs> There's one, okay. All right. The Two. people on the webinar say it's better than nothing. Better than nothing? Yeah. Did you just make that up? No, it's right here. Someone yeah. on the webinar said it. <laughs> um, great, okay. And so uh, welcome everybody to the panel discussion uh, portion of our talk today. Uh, I'm going to start off with a brief introduction for everybody to so know who everybody up here is. I'm going to start off all the way over on the right here. I've asked our panels to sit in terms of their political alignment. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, on the far right, we have Robin Gray. <laughs> that is definitely a joke. Uh, who is Vice President at Sussex Strategy Group, where she manages the environment practice. On behalf of her clients, she works on issues related to permits and approvals, <coughs> climate change policy, and release recovery. And next to Robin, we have Bennett Chen, who is a project manager at Climco Canada. Bennett is a chartered, chartered professional accountant with over five years of commercial and asset management expertise from working with two of the largest Canadian-based power companies. What are those? Where are those power companies, Bennett? Okay, great. Uh, he brings a background of contract negotiations and regulatory compliance to his current work as a project manager with Planco. And on my right here, we have Jacqueline Wilson, who is a lawyer with the Canadian Environmental Law Association. So save all of your heated legal questions <laughs> for Jacqueline. Um, and uh, she both litigates and works on law reform matters in relation to environmental law. She worked extensively on the cap and trade le legislation as it passed in the legislature. And Dave Sawyer, who I think you know, we've had a, a pretty good introduction to who Dave is. And on the far left is my esteemed colleague Dale Marshall, who is the National Program Manager at Environmental Defense, uh, where he works to move Canada towards greater action and responsibility on climate change and towards clean, modern, renewable energy technologies, while phasing out all fossil fuels such as oil, gas, coal, and natural gas. Do you want to add anything to that, Dale? <laughs> Great, okay. Um, so I'm going to let our panelists do a little bit of their own introduction uh, by asking them a first question, uh, which is, uh, tell us a little bit about the work that you are doing on uh, carbon pricing, pretty broad. I'm going to start on my left here with Dale. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I mean, carbon pricing is something that I have been working on for quite a few years, and uh, it's it's an issue that's always uh, part of the suite of policies that we advocate for when it comes to, to action on climate change. Um, in the lead up to the pan, to the development of the Pan Clean Framework, um, environmental defense actually chaired a, a group of uh, environmental groups and think tanks to try to come up with a collective proposal that can go that could feed into the um, federal government and the provinces to come up with. Um, to develop their carbon pricing system. Um, so that was some of the work that I did there. I mean, currently a lot of it is a combination of uh, government relations work and campaigning. Um, so, you know, we're regularly talking to government about the development of their carbon pricing system, um, the output-based pricing system as, as part of that. Um, and then, but then we also spend a lot of time talking to the general public, and it, it's carbon pricing is a tough issue to to sell to people. Um, whether you talk about it as a, as a um, carbon tax, and most people don't like a tax, and 
we're talking about a cap and trade system, and most most people don't entirely understand what that is. Um, so we spend a lot of time trying to um, explain what um, what carbon pricing is, basically through social media, through blogs, through research. Um, you know, working with people like Dave, who can really uh, look at the economics of carbon pricing and um, uh, and then try to communicate those to a general audience. Um, you know, doing communications tactics like Facebook Live events, telephone town halls, and just trying to get the word out around um, that carbon pricing is not a four-letter word, that it's something that is being um, implemented in, you know, I think it's something like 70 jurisdictions around the world, and as Dave has shown, uh, you if you don't introduce one versus you introduce one, it, can have very little impact on GDP, and yet it has, can have a substantial effect on reducing emissions, you know, as part of a suite of climate policies. Great, so I'm Jacqueline. Um, currently, we are, as CELA, going to be working on the new climate change plan in Ontario, so we'll be doing a lot of work on that and hoping to make it as stringent as possible. And CELA also filed recently what's called an application for review under the Environmental Bill of Rights, challenging the passing of the regulation that canceled cap and trade on procedural grounds. So we think that um, the requirements of the Environmental Bill of Rights weren't passed, so we um, filed what's called an application for review, which is currently uh, being looked at by the ministry, and we don't have a decision yet. And I can get into a little bit more about the details about that. Later, if you're interested. Okay, um, I'm Bennett, everybody. So I work for a company called Climco, so I'll talk a little bit more about what they do. Um, so with regards to carbon pricing, I'd like to say that we're in a commercial extension of a lot of our clients' teams, uh, because carbon policy just isn't about the environment anymore. It's about trade, it's about capital planning. Um, so we work with the regulatory compliance trading arms, and we really do a couple things. We help interpret regulations. Like right now, the reason why I have this is I have the Ottawa webinars playing in the background, um, just because they're trying to figure out what does this mean. Um, we assess and analyze the commercial impacts um, of carbon policy decisions, and then we got kind of advice, okay, when you're talking to government now, or even kind of local stakeholders, what's the conversation that you need to have? So we kind of jump around. Carbon policy has been incredibly dynamic. I've been in this industry specifically just for a year, and my mind's blown every day. Um, so it's just keeping pace because they're throwing deadlines at you left, right, and center. Um, we're talking about carbon policy here just with regards to OBPS, but what about low carbon fuels, uh, methane? It all starts to stack up. I'm uh, Robin, and uh, so uh, Sussex Strategy Group, we're a government relations and communications firm here in Toronto. Um, so we uh, focus, I focus predominantly on provincial works. Uh, I have federal colleagues in Ottawa um, who have federal government and we have a municipal team as well. So we see ourselves as, well, I am a lobbyist, it's not a dirty word, I am a lobbyist, um, and, but I, am a, I work predominantly in the environment field. So we are essentially interpreters for our clients who are, could be any part of trade associations, private sector, industry, um, they run the gamut, um, probably some of the same clients that uh, Bennett works with um, on a different side. Uh, but we help those clients interpret what's happening with government, what these policies are, what they're doing, um, and what impact they could have on their business you know, going forward right now, uh, but also if there's things that um, that's getting in the way in terms of regulation and things like that that we can help work through with government to make sure that their business can thrive. Um, and so with the last five or six years, it's been, uh, I've gotten incredibly busier on the environment side because of all the work that was going on with carbon pricing and climate change uh, action plan development. So we were helping our clients with really starting from scratch, introducing them to what cap and trade is um, and how it will affect them, all the rules, uh, going through talking to government about the benchmarks that would be applying to their sectors and uh, making sure that it makes sense to everybody. Um, so it got pretty technical and that's what I brought in technical experts to help with that, but um, so we helped them really interpret what was going on and so that they understood what was going to happen to them 
But on the flip side, also looking at the development of the Climate Change Action Plan and where all that funding was going and where they could be looking at funding opportunities to bring in really cool technology to the province and grow it here and possibly export it elsewhere. But, um, you know, kind of weighing up the risk and opportunities that came with the cap and trade program and the climate change uh, action plan development. Um, right now, we're in a bit of a transition period. Uh, so now we're explaining how that has been winding down, the impact that that's had on those clients, um, what the opportunities could be in the province, but also clearly looking to the federal uh, level of government and the federal carbon backstop uh, on that level and how that can impact them in a very short amount of time. Um, it doesn't feel like a lot of time. It looks like a lot of time, but it's really not between now and January 1st when the federal system comes in and explaining what the legal challenge piece is over here and how that can impact. So it's really deciphering a lot of that noise that's out there right now. Um, so my, uh, my first question is about some of the uh, impacts on greenhouse gas emissions that we might see uh, from Ontario's action to, to cancel cap and trade. Um, and we know across Canada, some provinces are unwilling to, to take action on climate or unwilling to um, apply a carbon price on their own. Uh, so my question is, is the federal backstop, and I'm going to put this out to any of our panelists who want to jump in and answer it, uh, is the federal backstop carbon pricing plan enough to drive the kind of greenhouse gas emissions that we need to see in these provinces like Ontario, like Saskatchewan, who, uh, who are unwilling to take action on their own or, um, or bring in a carbon price? I mean, carbon pricing isn't enough in the provinces that want to do things. We, we're always going to need a suite of policies to, to address this issue and to reduce emissions along, uh, along the lines of what the science says is necessary to avoid 2 degrees and stay well below 2 degrees or even 1.5 degrees. And it shows we have to reduce emissions really quickly. And so we can't leave any policy tools on the table. Um, Carbon pricing is an important element of a, of a climate plan, but you also need regulations. You also need spending programs. You also need incentives. Um, and so for those provinces that um, are doing that, want to take action, want to be climate champions, carbon pricing is important, um, but, but it's not enough. And for those provinces, that don't want to do anything, well, at least there is some measure that will reduce emissions there. Obviously, it won't be nearly enough. But there are also jurisdictional um, powers that the feds have to regulate as well. Um, you know, greenhouse gases are super toxic. The federal government has the right to regulate uh, toxins under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. So, um, so there are a number of ways that the federal government can uh, ensure that action is taken at the provincial level, uh, even with recalcitrant provinces. I also want to dive into the, the politics of this uh, as well. I mean, as we speak right now, I think they're in the legislature debating uh, Bill 4, the Cap and Trade Cancellation Act. Um, and uh, so I guess I will, um, well, let's, let's talk about Bill 4, actually. And I'm going to direct this one first to, uh, to Jacqueline, um, our, our legal expert here. How do you think the Cap and Trade Cancellation Act Bill 4 will play out in the legislature? Do you think we'll see any surprises there um, in the next week? Who knows how long? And if anybody else wants to jump in after Jacqueline. Great. So, um, Bill four is for legislature, or yeah, the yeah, legislative assembly. Um, in terms of surprises, um, I sure hope so. And I did want to mention um, that just a couple of days ago, Bill four was posted on the environmental registry, and there's a public comment period now that's open until October 11th. And I encourage everyone to put in comments and um, have your say that way. Um, so that's a good thing. So let's uh, let's comment and, and be active about it. Um, in terms of what's in it, um, you have a copy of the I, of right course I do. I, I, <laughs> I am a lawyer. I, you know, <laughs> um, just I'm gonna, I'm gonna, no, no, but I'm gonna, you know, go through a little bit. I have my highlighted copy with my comments. So, um, a couple of things that I'd like to see, um, focus on is, 
um, the targets. So we had legislated targets in the um, the previous bill. It's still there for now, but the Climate Change Mitigation Loan Carbon Economy Act, which is the act that set up the previous system with the Climate Change Action Plan, and cap and trade. So Climate Change Act, or whatever it's a short form. Um, and there was a couple things about those legislated targets. One, um, it set the actual number in the legislation, which I think is important. Um, it said that 1990 was the benchmark. Um, it had um, a requirement that the targets could be reduced, um, as in made more stringent. Sorry, they could be made more stringent, um, but there was nothing about making them less stringent in the act. Um, so in the new act, there's a provision allowing and giving discretion to the government, um, or actually committing to make targets, but I would like to see the targets actually in the act still. So I think that's a, an important piece. I think that was an important uh, thing in the old act, and I'd like to see that in the new one. Um, and all those pieces be in there. What the benchmark is, um, not rolling back to, um, you know, once you set a target that you can make it less stringent. So let's say, you know, you're locked, you're locked into this one, and then you can make it more stringent, and that would be great, but um, we can't do it. So that's one important piece. Um, and one other one I just want to mention is um, there's a commitment to make a new climate change action plan. Um, so that's important. Um, and, you know, the content of that will be, um, you know, we'll have to look at and we'll probably have ideas about what we should see in there in terms of other tools, right? So what Dale's talking about. Um, carbon pricing is sort of off the table, but um, provincially for right now, but there's regulations, there's incentive programs, there's you know voluntary measures, there's a whole other suite of tools, and so we should be looking at all of those. Um, but there's a couple other things in terms of sort of process or things that were in the old act that I'd like to see added in. So um, the current wording in Bill 4 talks about um, you know, creating a climate change plan and then it'll be revised from time to time. In the old act, it was every five years it was going to be looked at. Um, and then every year there was going to be um, a progress report that was tabled in the legislature. Um, so I'd like to see those commitments um, again. So every five years you look at it again, rather than a more open-ended, um, it'll be looked at from time to time. And every year put sort of a progress report to the legislature rather than in the, the Bill 4 as it currently reads. Um, it would just be posted on a public website, so it wouldn't be linked before the legislature. So those are sort of two ideas about the new act that I'd like to see kind of um, include what was in the previous act. Uh, anybody else have uh, any input about uh, Bill 4 and how you think it might pass through the legislature? Robin, I know you advise on your clients on a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, I think what we found interesting was that the, the timing, well, all the timing about all of this, but um, there was clearly it was June 15th when uh, Premier elect Ford at the time said that this was getting rid of cap and trade was first priority. Uh, and so we saw it was you know, one of the first pieces of, pieces of legislation that came out after the Urgent Priorities Act uh, that did a number of other things. Um, but so it seemed like this was a very urgent, urgent issue. Um, but uh, and you know, I think some of the, the steps that they took prior to this legislation coming forward essentially killed cap and trade in its tracks before this legislation even had to come out. So the, the damage, I guess you could say, was was done to the program uh, before that with, with some of the uh, revoking of regulation that was in place um, and putting in a new one that essentially prohibited all um, trading to go on on the allowance, on the Ontario allowance side. But, but then we saw, you know, so I think a lot of us anticipated seeing this piece of legislation pass before the end of the summer session. Um, but it didn't, and that's mostly, I think, because we saw Bill 5, which everybody may know about. Everyone knows what notwithstanding means now. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of, that took a lot more attention away from everything else, but I, I don't think it it made an impact on, you know, I think we all knew at that point cap and trade was, was gone. Um, uh, and we, did, we didn't need legislation to, to tell us that at that point. So uh, they will, I think they will proceed they're going to pass uh, Bill 4. Um, they, I think the focus for them, I mean, they have a consultation period now, but uh, I mean, this legislation could pass before that consultation period is done. We haven't gotten clarity on that. So, uh, but I think to your point, I think it's good to still, it's really important to still provide input and feedback into that process um, to indicate concern or feedback, but also when they're talking about the development of a climate plan and what you would want to see in that. 
uh, and different components, knowing that funding is going to be challenging, uh, but looking at other aspects and different things that you can um, have part of that plan. So it's really, it's still really, really important to provide feedback through that system. But um, I think we'll see it pass probably mid, mid to late October. Um, we'll see if they take it to committee. Right now they're saying they will. Um, but we've seen so far with other pieces of legislation, uh, nothing's gone to committee yet. It's been time allocated for all you legislative nerds. So, um, so yeah, we'll have to see what the timing is, but it's not as urgent as we once thought it was going to be. And if they do send it to committee, uh, there may be another chance to give input and, and to speak at committee, potentially for, uh, for folks who want to have their voices heard on that. And I should also mention that the Clean Economy Alliance will be putting together a submission um, to uh, to give to the government on Bill 4. Um, and we encourage members to also give individual submissions, but uh, we'll be putting one together uh, as sort of a group effort as well. So watch your Watch your inboxes for that uh, those drafts and ideas coming, uh, and also feel free to just reach out to me and uh, and tell me what you think uh, before you receive any drafts. Oh, can, yes, can I just ask a question? So I know that we had this 2.8 billion that came from cap and trade, but how much money would we expect? Like, how much money would we have with just the federal carbon system? You're talking about revenues? We do have a question uh, a little bit later. We're going to have a whole section on revenues. Um, so I'm going to parking lot that for now, but we're definitely going to get to it. Um, my next question, I want to get to the politics of the, the federal politics now. We've talked a little bit about the Ontario politics. Um, and uh, I mean, what, do you, what about the political dynamics of uh, applying a federal carbon price? How do you think Ontarians will react come January 1st uh, when that comes into play? Um, good, bad? Who knows? Anybody have strong feelings? I think so much of this is going to surround education. Um, I think it depends how does this impact you as a person. So if you work for an industry, you're going to have a very strong view about it uh, because you're going to hear it every day when you go to work. Um, it's your jobs, it's your cousins. Um, so if you think competitiveness is a real risk, whether or not you feel like it's quantified or not, um, that's going to be your position on it. If I think there's a lot of people here locally that are very, very committed to the environment, and that's great. Um, you see that it's a push in the right direction. So I, I think, unfortunately, for better or for worse, I think most of people's opinions are going to be quite qualitative. It's going to be emotional. Um, so you're going to see you're going to see a good mix of that. I think. Um, I think people will be, uh, de depending on when you see the impact of it first, I think people will be surprised that, um, you know, in terms of your natural gas bill, there's been a lot of coverage by the provincial government that there will be a, a, we'll see a reduction in your bill because there's no longer a cap and trade cost on it. Um, there will be a cost, a carbon tax cost on your natural gas bill come January 1st. And so there, I think there's going to be some confusion about that. Um, We'll see if there is a line item on your natural gas bill that says this is a federal carbon tax, not anything to do with the province. Um, but there's, you know, I think there's going to be some confusion about this because I mean, we see it with industry who are actively participating or did in the cap and trade and now with the federal system pending legal challenges. Um, who, and they're confused. And so I can only imagine if you're trying to follow this and see where. Now, who's applying what and when and how and why is this more than I was paying for when it came to carbon? Um, I think people are going to get upset and there's going to be some some frustration on that side. And I think it's a good point. It's about educating what this means. Uh, the federal side will have to clearly explain what's happening um, and you know the benefits of this, where this is going, uh, you know, from the abstract down to the everyday. Um, but it is. I think people will be. This is going to catch people off guard who haven't been following this as closely as people in this room. And what uh, what do folks think are the ways that we should be educating people on uh, the introduction of a carbon price? Uh, there's obviously a lot of people who don't understand uh, the goal or don't understand how or why it's applied. Um, so what are those next steps in educating people about this carbon pricing? I mean, I, I think I think the important part is to certainly there's an education process, but a big part of it is also talking about what the, the benefits of the system are, um, and there are benefits 
in the form of greenhouse gas emissions, but there are also benefits that are that are held more personally, such as health benefits, um, local economic benefits that need to be discussed more. If, if, if we're stuck talking about the mechanism of carbon pricing and how it gets applied and how it gets, you know, we've lost people. Um, there's going to be a massive overlay of politics and partisanship on top of this because of, you know, a PC Ontario government, a liberal federal government, um, who's doing what, how, where people's ideology falls. I mean, all of that's going to get mixed up into people's assessment of this. And for those who want to see a carbon price, I think it's I think it's important for us to be talking about um, why we're doing it, that it is effective, that it is a polluter pay system, and that there are benefits that will that, that directly impact on you, such as you know cleaner air and and, uh, and healthier communities. Um, so one of the challenges we had for years was these sort of acute pocketbook costs. So facilities, households, and no balancing of sort of benefits, because the benefits were sort of intergenerational and they're diffuse. So you get acute costs, local constituents, diffuse benefits, you can't really get your head around. What's fundamentally changed, obviously, is what's going on with weather, right? And so the wildfires out west, you know, I'm hearing all of a sudden a bunch of people talking about people I hadn't heard talk about before talking about climate change and, and weather. So although there may not be a direct link between our actions say, in Ontario and emission reductions and global climate change leading to wildfires in British Columbia, folks are bundling these together. And, and slowly, and certainly at the political level, you hear this from the Minister of the Environment quite a bit, and I think she's sort of leading a little bit on the thinking, that, you know, is basically, yeah, you know what, this stuff's here now. Uh, and, and so that's changed the calculus, I think, quite a, quite a bit. We'll continue to change the calculus. There will always be the pocketbook folks who are screaming about, you know, 10 bucks, you know, three three coffees out of my pocket, I think it's unacceptable. And that'll go on. But I think generally you're hearing, yeah, cool, yeah, and we all know this, we're going to read it, right? Uh, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit to talk about some uh, business and industry and competitiveness impacts. Um, and I wanted to direct this one to, to Robin and Bennett specifically, because I know you work with a lot of companies in, in industry. Uh, so cap and trade, as we all know, was cancelled very abruptly, uh, and it left many cap and trade participants holding allowances, uh, which we don't know how much they'll be reimbursed. Uh, it seems a little unclear. Uh, there's been some information, but it's it's a bit vague. Uh, so can you walk us through what kind of sum costs uh, a cap and trade participant might be facing um, now that there's all this uncertainty in the air? Um, yeah, I mean, there's... Uh, during the development of the, the cap trade program, I mean, there was people were companies saw that this was not it's not just an environmental issue. You had to bring on accountants. You had to bring as a financial thing. You had if you were working in different commodity markets, you were bringing in your traders. Um, so it got bigger than just like you said, it's bigger than an environment issue um, at its core. So it uh, it did people had to bring on some of the companies that we were working with. You know, they had to bring on someone like me to help explain it from a government perspective, but you also had, you know, having to bring on, um, if you if you were hadn't, hadn't reported before, you're having to bring on people to quantify your emissions, someone to verify them, uh, or get someone trained internally to do that. Um, you were having to bring on, you know, more infrastructure inside to have to actually go through the, you know, make sure you're compliant under the kit system, um, and and having more people involved. I mean, that it wasn't. A straightforward system in terms of you know getting your CEO involved and having them sign up. There was a lot of there were a lot of uh, details to it, uh, but everyone seemed to get into it uh, by the time the program got started. But there was a lot of internal infrastructure that had to be built out for that. And I think with the federal system, we could probably use some of that um, some of the same infrastructure, uh, but it'll just in a different way. Um, so it's it it did have a sunken cost. But I think it also too going back to where the some of the funding was going to be going from the cap and trade revenue. Um, people were making plans and industry was making plans about some of that money um, that they thought they had new contracts for, and so they had been bringing in people from other maybe other facilities across the country in North America um, to start working on projects here. 
And so there were some sunken costs on that side in terms of investment, reinvestment into those things, maybe taking money from other projects because they thought they were getting money from the Green on Challenge or from the Green on Industries program. So there's some missed opportunities there and that has some sunken costs uh, go along with it as well. I know that the next question on here is just what kind of challenges exist as we move into uh, most likely a federal uh, president carbon. So Ben, I feel free to answer that as well as the, the sunk costs question. Sure, I'll touch on a couple sunk costs that I think um, we need to talk about also, which is it's time. There's so much time that's being spent on this. Um, it's not just time that is driving towards something in the future. There's sunk time. It's make work. It's administration. So now from an unwinding standpoint, there's new reporting regulations that need to happen that nobody was expecting. So what does that mean? Um, I think the other thing is political uncertainty is the biggest risk for industry right now, and that's a sunk cost. Uh, because it's conversations. It's conversations with everybody in this room potentially because you're all stakeholders. Um, these are some costs that we all also absorb as, as citizens. Um, so that's something that I think I'd also flag. Uh, with regards to the biggest challenges, I think capacity building. So the amount of time that Robin kind of referenced about building up into cap and trade, industry needs to do that now. And industry, they don't operate just in Ontario. So if you think of some of these large organizations, they're happening in Saskatchewan where there's a constitutional challenge. They're in Manitoba, they're in Alberta. Every possible carbon pricing system out in the world right now, I think some form of it exists here in Canada. So you have one person potentially for the ones that haven't you know, scaled up for this where this is a collateral duty for them. So they're doing health and safety. They're doing everything else that we care about also because we care about the safety of a lot of the people that work at these businesses. Now they need to tackle six different carbon pricing regimes. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges I think industry has right now. So beyond that, I would say, what if you don't understand the output-based system? So right now, all of a sudden, all the negotiations that happen with the ministry, they're doing again. What's the benchmark? Are your process submissions taken care of? Um, competitiveness is the biggest issue that we want to talk about, which is very hard to quantify that Dave was mentioning. Um, I think to your first question, if I can just kind of detour for two seconds, the biggest thing I think we need to think about is when you introduce policy decisions, especially when with regard to pricing, I find this as a supply side driver of environmental change. You're changing this industry that's creating the things that people are going to be buying. We haven't talked about demand side. Um, if you are a fully trade exposed organization, your buyers aren't the people in this room that care about the environment. They're price sensitive. Um, what are we doing to impact that? So it's not a localized conversation. It's it's a much bigger and more complex conversation. Sorry, I like to rant. <laughs> um, and you mentioned uh, open face pricing as well. Um, and I know, uh, Dale, I know that you have uh, been working very hard to uh, to engage in a lot of the consultation that the federal government is uh, is doing uh, on open-based pricing. So I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about uh, about that work and about uh, about what you think is, is the goal of this system and how effective it might be moving forward. Yeah, well, I mean, Dave took us through a little bit of an explanation of what the open-based pricing system is. Um, I mean, essentially, it's a way to make sure that uh, <coughs> industries aren't shutting down in Ontario and moving somewhere else because of carbon pricing system. And obviously, that's a lot of a goal. You don't want to lose economic activity and still have the same level of greenhouse gas emission. Um, there's, uh, I mean, there, I bet there are different ways of doing that. And what we've been trying to encourage the federal government to think about is some of the research that's been done around competitiveness and carbon pricing uh, and, and structure this output-based pricing system, it's essentially a concession to industry um, uh, that is that, that gets the impact that you want. And Dave talked about when you have the marginal price, you do get that effect at the margin, you do get the, the emission reductions. Um, but ensuring that, that there are incentives in the long term to actually move towards cleaner industries. Um, and so this system has to be temporary. It has to be something that is where the amount of emissions that are, that are exempted goes down over time. Um, and it should also 
for obvious reasons, be targeted at the industries that actually do face competitiveness issues. Right? So research has been done that shows that about 5% of the Canadian economy is faces competitiveness concerns around a $30 a ton carbon price. Um, and yet the list of industries that are on the output-based pricing system make up a much larger percentage of the Canadian economy than that. And so what, what you're doing when you're not, when you're including too many industries or too many entities is um, in, in part of this output-based pricing system is um, you're not giving them the same level of incentive. You're, you end up with a policy that is less rigorous. It doesn't get the emission reductions you want. Um, and it's not targeted to industries that you actually are trying to protect. Um, and so, you know, there's a, there's a trade-off there between um, a system that does allow for um, to deal with industries that are both trade exposed, emissions intensive trade exposed, but at the same time is still an effective policy. And so trying to trying to ensure that the OBPS is, is in fact targeted and temporary and also transparent so we actually see why it is that these industries, these sectors in particular have been chosen is something that we've been encouraging and quite frankly not making much head, um, headway on. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Thing. Yeah, well, so yeah, I'm doing a bunch of work on the base pricing at the facility level and you know, it's a good story for industry to show up and say, oh, we're in bad. It's bad. Like, we're, we're, we're in a lot of business. Um, so cutting through, I mean, we need analytics and good information and stock take and actually cut through that sort of conjecture. And then and then the other side of that argument, of course, is, oh, well, they, they can, who cares? They're fine. They can take that from the So you can see ministers sitting there trying to balance these interests, right? And the open based pricing I actually credit with moving politicians on the climate file because it gave them a way out to deal with competitiveness and not get neurotic about it because they, they're very neurotic about competitiveness because their doors are getting kicked in on a daily basis by industry. Um, so so it's actually given us a nice middle ground to move forward. I fully agree it's a transitional uh, program. Um, ideally, we'd move to a border carbon adjustment, frankly, uh, and just to deal with their exports and their imports. Uh, but that's probably a long way off. Uh, and then, like in California, although California's having a hard time implementing it, but you, you transition from that factor of one I talked about, where you get all your sort of output-based allocation, you get, you get sort of a bunch of emissions from free, and that phases down in time as other pro as other jurisdictions catch up, and as, as, as sort of your operations transition. So it should be transitional. But once you lock these things in, they're hard to change. So really like it, but I think we're setting ourselves up to be locked into a policy for quite a while. Uh, I'm going to shift gears again a little bit here um, and ask some questions about the legal aspects of carbon pricing. Uh, since we've been talking a little bit about the federal plan, uh, I will ask um, Jacqueline here, uh, if you can just walk us quickly through Ontario's legal challenge of the federal government's uh, plan to uh, apply a carbon pricing system. and. Uh, I mean, are there ways that this can encroach uh, on, that, that the federal plan can encroach on provincial jurisdiction, or is it just fully, no, the federal government has jurisdiction here and they're just going to go in and do it and that's going to be upheld? So, um, like most legal questions, there's no clean yes or no answer, and it's, you know, a lot more you know, up in the air and all that. So, you're not going to get like a great answer to that. But, um, What's going on now in Ontario is what's called a reference has been filed in the Ontario Court of Appeal to challenge the constitutionality of the federal act, um, which mirrors the one that's in Saskatchewan that was filed already. Um, and what it's going to look at is our Constitution Act 1867 divides powers between the federal and provincial government in sections 91 and 92. Um, but environment isn't listed in either list. So the environment is always a messy division of powers issue. And there's a lot of case law talking about, you know, both jurisdictions of government kind of in general having jurisdiction under various um, what they call heads of power, which is this list under 91 and 92, um, to deal with environmental issues in general. In this case, we're probably going to be looking at, in the case, arguments on four federal heads of power. So the ones that are likely to come up are um, there's a sort of general 
um, kind of catch-all federal power called Peace Order and Good Government. And there's two branches of the Peace Order and Good Government power. Um, one is an emergency unit branch, which isn't uh, basically not going to apply. So it's a temporarily limited um, type of emergency. So we may think climate change is an emergency, but the case law it's talking more about like if there's a war or something like that. Like so, it's temporarily limited. So what we'll see likely is an argument about the second branch of the POG powers, as it's called in legal circles, um, which is the national concern test. So that's one possibility for upholding the federal law. Um, and we saw that used in um, a case called Crown Cellar Bath. It goes back um, quite a few decades now. Uh, but it was talking about marine dumping um, and marine pollution. And that was how a federal marine dumping law was upheld. So that's one possibility. The next one is the criminal law power, um, which um, has actually been used quite a bit in environmental law. So um, CEPA, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, was upheld as um, a valid federal law um, criminal law power um, in the hydro Quebec case. And there was actually a recent uh, case called Syncru that was looking at um, a renewable fuel regulation that was passed under CEPA, and that was upheld under the criminal law power. So um, that's another possibility that we're going to see some arguments about. Then the third one is um, the trade and commerce power. So there is a trade and commerce power um, from the federal government. It's been pretty narrowly construed to leave room for a provincial power um, for property and civil rights. But um, there's also two branches under the trade and commerce power. One deals with um, international trade and interprovincial trade. Um, and then there's kind of a general one that looks at things like provincial inability to deal with it. So that's a possibility as well. Um, and then the last one is there's a federal taxation power. <laughs> Probably the first one I should have mentioned, but anyway, there's a pretty broad federal taxation power. Um, there are also provincial powers for taxation. Um, and interestingly, there's a power that was added, interesting to lawyers, maybe, I don't know. Um, in 1982, there was a provincial power added for taxation of non renewable resources given to the province. And so I think that there'll be some arguments about whether this is actually hitting that power rather than the federal taxation power. But anyway, I think that's how um, it'll look. Um, I think it'll be very interesting, actually. So, do you have any any bets on whether it's going to go one way or another? I know it's just a basic yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, and and there have also been some lawsuits within Ontario, um, as I'm sure you all know. Greenpeace uh, just and it just sued the Ontario government. I watched a lawsuit, and um, and. That kind of leads me to thinking about what is the way that they cancel cap and trade in Ontario, in your opinion, legal? Um, I know Greenpeace's lawsuit uh, takes on how uh, how the Environmental Bill of Rights was was basically not properly respected. Um, can you tell us a little bit about about that and how that might stack up? Sure. So um, the Greenpeace lawsuit and um, what I mentioned briefly when I was chatting at the beginning about the CELA application for review um, are dealing with the same subject matter for the most part, although there's another piece of the Greenpeace lawsuit, which I'll mention in a second. Um, and it's talking about the notice and comment provisions under the Environmental Bill of Rights. So there's a duty under the Environmental Bill of Rights for environmentally significant decisions to post the decisions for notice um, and provide an opportunity for comment. But there are a bunch of other duties in there as well. So um, there's a requirement for the, the minister making the decision to consider the comments and explain how the comments affected the decision. There's a requirement to consider the statement of environmental values for each of the ministries. There's a requirement for a regulatory impact statement. So um, in CELA's view, and um, shared by uh, Greenpeace in that lawsuit, um, the way that that regulation was passed to, kind of, to stop trading didn't, didn't meet the requirements of the Environmental Bill of Rights. So um, in the notice that was posted to the Environmental Registry, the government um, made the argument that uh, they didn't have to follow the requirements because the election process um, was substantially equivalent is um, what, uh, there's an exception in Section 30 of the Environmental Bill of Rights that if there's a substantially equivalent process, um, you don't have to also go through the Environmental Bill of Rights. So they said the, the election process was substantially equivalent and the environmentally significant aspects of the decision have been um, dealt with through the process. So in our application for review that we filed under the Environmental Bill of Rights, 
um, we took issue with some of that. So we mentioned, um, you know, a couple of things I just mentioned. So there's no regulatory impact statement. There's no ability for every Ontarian to, you know, provide comments um, in making a, a policy platform that's discussed in, a, in an election, right? It's a, it's a totally different beast. Um, there's no requirement for the decision maker to consider those comments or to explain how those comments have been considered. Um, we mentioned that, you know, there was a lot of confusion in uh, the fuel debate and calling cap and trade a carbon tax. And so that kind of muddies the water a little bit about like whether, you know, really the environmental impacts were considered, those types of things. So, um, so we filed an application for review under the Environmental Bill of Rights. Um, the Greenpeace lawsuit is um, what's called the application for judicial review, and it's going to the courts. So um, they've made a similar argument. Um, I can't really like, talk too much about their lawsuit because, of course, I'm you know, not involved, but um, I've you know, seen briefly what they were talking about. Um, they made that argument, and then they've also um, made an argument that the regulation that was passed. Um, so regulations are passed under um, a statute. That's how um, there's authority to pass regulations. And they're supposed to um, conform with the purpose of the statute. So they're making the argument that this regulation was actually antithetical to the purpose of the statute that it was passed under, which is the Climate Change Mitigation and Low Carbon Act, the point of which was to create market mechanisms and reduce greenhouse gases. And that the regulation is antithetical to that rather than um, in conformity with that. So, those are sort of their two main arguments on the regulation, and they also made the argument um, that Bill 4 should be posted, which it now has been. So, the day after they filed. The day after they filed, so that's great. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jeff. That was very informative. Um, I know we're running short on time, so I'm going to ask one last question uh, to our, all our panelists, and then we're going to move on to uh, audience questions here. Uh, and if I can ask you to keep, keep your answer uh, as brief as possible, but it is kind of a broad question. I want to talk about revenues. Uh, from the federal uh, percent carbon, and so it'll it'll be bringing in billions in revenue uh, just in Ontario, and uh, and that revenue will be increasing as the price on carbon increases. Um, so can you uh, tell us, first of all, where you think this revenue is most likely to be directed, and second of all, where you think it would actually be most effective uh, for it to be directive uh, to to be directed? Start over here, there. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to have a keen political eye that a year before an election, these revenues are going to be used for political purposes. Um, I, we have we have encouraged the government. They showed what you can do with revenues, right? Investment in emission reduction programs and actually get potentially even a bigger bang for your buck in terms of uh, emission reductions than the actual carbon price. And so we have encouraged the federal government to actually invest them in programs in the, in the province um, to get further emission reductions. Um, we're getting very much the sense that these are going to be sent, there are going to be checks in the mail um, for political reasons. And so what I'm hopeful of is that if, in fact, that second option is chosen and money is sent directly to households, that that's only a temporary measure and over time that actually shifts um, to the point where this money is returned to the province, but in ways that, re that actually reduces emissions and also benefits people, right? So, you know, efficiency program for homes. I mean, th that's ways that can directly benefit people and help with, with climate change. Um, and so there's a political gain there as well. Yeah, I th I just a quick thought. I don't think the feds have the capacity right now to make some crazy game the size of the federal bureaucracy. They don't have the capacity to effectively design programs to roll them out in the short term. So I think it's also a little bit of expediency. I was involved in the Low Carbon Economy Fund, the $2 million fund that was rolled out, and they have a hard time doing that. They're just looking at proposals from the provinces to fund, and they had a hard time getting through the 120 of those and coming up with an approach and you know something that would stand up to Auditor General type rigor. Which scares them as well, right? So, so yeah, I think I think they're going to cut checks and then and then circle back if they're lucky. <laughs> if we're lucky, we're lucky. Um, what we'd like to see um, is an environmental justice and equity perspective being applied to how the funds that are raised are used. So, um, 
and in general, climate change is very unfair in its impacts. Low-income, disadvantaged people are least responsible for it, and they're most impacted by climate change. And so what we'd like to see is um, revenue that's raised, um, you know, not all of it, but a bunch of it, put towards programs that help low-income and disadvantaged people participate in the low-carbon economy, reduce their emissions, um, get, you know, for instance, capital costs that they're not going to have any way of um, getting to do um, housing retrofits, that kind of thing. Um, and California has a really great model that we would love to see. So in California, there's a legislated requirement for 35% of the revenue raised to go to disadvantaged communities. So they've um, looked at 25% going to um, projects in disadvantaged communities, 5% to um, sort of like in general to help those communities and 5% for communities that are kind of bordering those communities. And they did a whole process um, um, to look at how to identify who should be included in the disadvantaged communities bracket. And they looked at a couple of different things like um, you know, other pollution in the area. So as we all know, you know, greenhouse gas emissions aren't in a vacuum. They're often you know, associated with other air pollution, that kind of thing. So looking at other air pollution in the area, socioeconomic status, um, sensitivity to uh, the impacts, that kind of thing. And then you know, they identify the communities and then the programs are targeted. And the other interesting thing that they've done, which I think is really important, is this 35% target doesn't mean that every program has to have 35% of the money go towards those communities. It's a um, it's across the whole um, amount of revenue that's raised. So they figured out you know targets. So for say transportation, they said okay that's something that can have a really big impact in those communities. So we'll make our target 55% um, of that funding should go towards projects in low income communities. But say for wetlands restoration, the target is zero because that doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, you know they're looking at like wetland function and that kind of thing. So that's what we would love to see the California model um, implemented by the federal government. Um, so for me, where do I think the money is going to go? Uh, based on the memorandums I've heard, they will be given back to the province and it'll be at their discretion. Um, so that's a version of things that I've heard. Uh, where I would like to see working with industry, um, I think the one thing that we should discount is the notion of corporate social responsibility. That's a growing trend. Um, so to, don't discount what industry will do with the dollars either. Um, they're engaging with stakeholders more and more, um, and they're open to, to stakeholder feedback. Uh, I think there's there's so many ways to look at it. I mean, from what I've heard, I think there were some comments made by the Prime Minister when he first came to see uh, Premier Ford. He uh, alluded to the fact that this would be going straight to um, to individuals uh, or to households, I should say. I'm not sure which one of you decided that in Ontario. Uh, you know, essentially bypassing the provincial government and so that you'll get a check signed by Justin Trudeau at least a couple of times before the election next year. So, uh, so yeah, politically driven, clearly, but, um, but I mean, the straight environmentalist in me would, would think that this money should go to, if you're looking to make serious reductions in emissions here and everywhere, is to go to technology and to introduce new technology both here, but that you can export to places where there's some serious emission reductions that need to take place uh, that you can see on a more exponential scale. Um, and I've heard of some projects that were being developed in Ontario, but they were going to take that technology to China and to India, where you can see some heavy duty emission reductions. So on that scale of things, I would love to see a lot of money go there um, to those kind of investments. And I think that's something that this government would actually be really interested in because it's you're developing the technology in Ontario, you know, the jobs are here, you're taking them somewhere else. Um, but uh, but I mean, there's the political play of this as well, and people want to see they want to see some of that money too. But it's there's so many there's so many factors playing all at the same time. You know, does me getting a check in the mail actually going to end? Is what I do, probably not. Um, but uh, and should I get the same amount of a check? I don't have a, I don't have a car. I live in an apartment. I mean, I don't have the same carbon costs as somebody else who has a car and has a house. So, you know, is that fair? Um, do I need any of that money? So it's uh, it's it's tough. And I, I think it's when you're a year out of an election and we've made this it's such a political issue in, in Ontario and on the federal level. Um, I think it's a really tough call where that money should be best used. Um, it just depends on what, what's really driving you at that moment. 
Um, so first thing I'm going to see if we have any questions from our webinar uh, participants there. No? No questions? Okay. No, not right now. Well, audience, uh, live audience then, uh, do we have any questions for our panelists uh, that you'd like to ask? Was your question answered to Not quite, but um, yeah, so I just wanted to know what is the difference in the revenues with the federal versus the cap and trade? Um, yeah, I mean, depending on the curve and price, but in 2022, it's two billion and change versus five billion. So it's two and a half times. So one and a half times 2024. Sorry, the Fed's higher. Fed's higher. Fed's higher. And there'll be the, the and chances are the stringency of the benchmarks for large final bidders will be tougher, so we more money there as well. Um, so yeah, it's a, they're big numbers. It's about one to two percent of Ontario total revenue. So not a big number. Why are we fighting over it for politics? But yeah, it's still a million dollars. I got a question. To, to your point that it's not that big a number, um, you were talking about competitiveness impact. I mean, five million is a lot, obviously, for from where I'm coming from. It is, but um, you were talking about competitive impacts and kind of saying that they are material, and yet we don't see a real change in, in GDP from having a price versus no price versus a different price and etc. So maybe I'd be curious to unpack whether the competitive concerns are 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 real. And then I've got a second part to the question, uh, which is that if we don't know where the revenue is going to go, do we know? whether businesses or households or anybody is better or worse off with this system versus the previous system? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll answer the first one and let others maybe conject on the second. Um, so it's a distributional issue. So the total account, so first of all, you realign, so what are the basic economics? You're realigning <laughs> prices for low and high, low versus high emission intensity goods and services. So you're shifting consumption and you're shifting invest, investment basically. Um, so you've got this surge in technology, some people do better off, but then you've got a drag in productivity. So there's this sort of renewable energy, sunshine, jobs and goodness, but then energy costs go up to some extent. And then so those energy costs are acute for some and hammer some folks. I think of like the lime sector, right? So they're you know really emission intensive. So the energy is like 10 to 15 percent of their total operating costs, which is quite a big number, right? It's quite a big number. The typical manufacturing plant is less than 1 percent. It's a small, small number. So for some, it's more acute, and then you, you start seeing in the, in the models, and, and when you look at the balance sheets of folks, you start seeing basically eating all the profit away. When you start eating profit away, uh, then you, you, there's no sort of incentive to reinvest, and then you start basically having these out, output faults. So some would say, well, that's good. We should get out of those high emitting facilities. But politicians don't like, you know, don't like to be responsible for that. So anyway, so, so it's really a distributional issue. So some are better off. Some are actually capturing market share. You know, economies moving around, green economy, and then some are, are, are getting drag. And it's that drag that's really acute and you really see. And that's where all the, the you know, that's the world squeaky, squeakiness comes from. I guess it meant though relative to other factors like say the exchange rate or the price of oil or things like that, how significant is carbon pricing on general competitiveness and productivity in the economy? Yeah, right. So so pulp and paper. So when we looked at the Ontario report for pulp and paper, they were the lowest producing, the lowest, the, the highest cost, lowest margin uh, producers for a pulp facility globally. They had ten or twelve sort of facilities. We looked at all the numbers and they're the lowest. Exchange rate moved 30 percent. They're the top top performer. So you have to be really you have to be really careful, and you got to actually look you know, look look at this stuff a lot. Industry will say, oh, it's a straw that broke the camel back, the camel's back, and oh, the reporting requirements and this, and you're layering there and there. And you trust to hear from you guys because you're dealing with on a daily basis. But you're it's a straw that broke the camel's back, and it's an acute straw. And why are you doing this to me now? And finally, the last point is we, because we don't talk about industrial policy in Canada, climate policy is become a de facto window on industrial policy. So all the ills of exchange rate and investment are being lumped in because the door is open to that conversation. So that, that's a bit of a long round of sorry. Does anybody else want to respond to that? I, I think that's really a uh, really interesting point. I mean, I was we were doing some work this week from the food processing sector in Ontario and, and they're um, they're they're in a pretty bad spot if they're switching over to the federal carbon system. Uh, just because of some of the size of the facilities, they get caught and they're having to spend 
you know, if you're not a large enough facility, you don't have a pricing or an uh, output based pricing system standard, you're having to pay the full cost of the fuel that you're using to burn uh, or for your combustion on site. So they're they're really worried, really worried about that. And they, I mean, food processing is not a huge lucrative business. I mean, they live in the margins a lot of the time because it depends on where their markets are and where the products are coming from. They have a lot of vulnerabilities. And, and talking to them, they said, you know, yeah, this is we have to watch this, and we're making sure that we're compliant with with the uh, with the carbon whatever system is going to be in place, but we also have to worry about employment costs. We have to worry about labor, uh, insurance. All I mean, there's so many different factors, and like you said, this is this is one. And in some places, electricity costs are the biggest thing. So, you know, can we focus, can we get the government to focus on that instead of focusing on the climate piece? So, they they see this as one piece, but um, but yeah, it gets it gets turned into this you know, this very small little target of carbon policy and all the attention was onto that, whereas there's a myriad of other issues and other costs that go into doing business in Ontario, especially for some of these pretty vulnerable companies right now. I think, uh, any last last question from that floor? Yeah. Um, hi. So I'm going to out myself as perhaps the most naive person in this room. Um, I'm actually, I work with the Toronto Youth Cabinet. We oh, have some yeah. council on uh, issues for youth from Toronto. And I'm also a grad student at UT's Faculty of Medicine, so healthcare and politics matter. Um, I'm wondering, we've been talking, of course, from a federal and provincial level, is there any way that we can leverage local partnerships, especially in the city of Toronto, um, to sort of drive forward these things that we've been talking about today? Yeah, that's a great question. Does anybody want to uh, jump in? I mean, I, I know just personally, having worked in, in municipal politics, that uh, that there's a, a pretty ambitious climate plan at the local level um, that Toronto has, uh, Transform TO, and, um, and it is disappointing to see every year that there's a fight to, to get that funded. Um, and uh, I think that I think that in terms of climate policy in Ontario right now, we're seeing a lot of a lot of impacts on municipalities as a lot of those programs are not funded uh, again. Um, programs for retrofits to social housing buildings and municipalities. Um, a lot of a lot of programs that maybe didn't get a lot of press when they were first announced, and then suddenly uh, municipalities are realizing that they have huge holes in their budget right now. Um, so I think that a lot of that municipal infrastructure is uh, has very very real climate Im and emissions impacts, uh, but doesn't people don't always think of it when they think of how we can lower carbon emissions. Um, so I think I guess that's that's one aspect. Does anybody else have? Sure. Um, I'll. Kind of like a two-pronged answer. So on um, the, the local level is the level that we need to be talking about. So if I think about the U.S. as an example, you, you see what Trump has done. So I'm not going to belabor that. But you've also seen a lot of the states now step up and do things. You've seen municipalities step up and do things. So a good example of where I think you see some of this environmental stuff happening in Canada already is, I believe it's Victoria, Vancouver, and going to throw Montreal on there, but I might be wrong. They have local gas taxes that feed into their metro systems. So they've introduced their own municipal-based taxes to do that. So you do see it happen, um, and more of it would probably be interesting to see. We do have a municipal election, supposedly, yeah. happening right now. <laughs> so ask the candidates about you know, what they plan to do in terms of, uh, of climate change and emissions reduction. To follow up on that, um, do cities have the power to raise their own taxes? Um, and, you ask. and if so, also, um, is there anything to stop citizens from demanding their cities to put in programs, let's say, a free smart thermostat for every single person who lives in that city? I think, uh, I mean, in terms of smart thermostats, that it's it's just sort of a revenue problem that would be stopping them from giving out free smart thermostats to everyone. I know there are there's a home energy loan program in Toronto. There are some uh, smaller scale uh, incentive programs. Uh, there's programs to, to help you put a green roof on your uh, on your roof, but they don't really have the, the funding to do those on a broad scale. Um, in terms of taxation powers, uh, they definitely have the power to, to tax on property taxes. Uh, Jacqueline, I don't know if you want to speak to uh, broader ability to tax. Uh, as far as I know, they can't tax on income, but there are some councillors who claim that they could potentially. No, I'm not sure, but I don't think so. I don't think they have. 
And not gas either, right? In Ontario. It's pretty, yeah, yeah it's resident, it's pretty limited. Uh, they, they could put in special taxes like a land transfer tax, if you have in Toronto, uh, like a vehicle registration tax. So you can do some specific taxes, and I don't know what the limitations are on that, but it's it's fairly limited. Um, property taxes are the big one, but you can raise property taxes, which could be a way to do it. That's really popular. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, if uh, there are no more questions, I know um, I just want to. First, oh yeah, can I just because I think it's a naive question that you're kind of getting at. I guess I keep wondering. I keep hearing from people who talk to the minister that it's just not going to happen. But it seems to me there's so many sectors and people who are upset about this. Is it is it possible to stop like this this um, the cap and trade program from being repealed, or is that really just it's it's a done deal? If like we just go through the motions now. And I think that's that's why I, I'm personally cautiously optimistic to see that they have opened up for consultation and it will most likely go in, be going to committee because if enough people state that they're paying attention, they're watching this, they care, and they want to see some kind of climate programs. I mean, cap and trades might be that system itself, but I think they've backed themselves into a political corner on that, which may be difficult to move out of. But uh, but I, I think you know if people are willing to to speak out in large numbers. Who knows? Is anybody else? There may have been a time when they when they could have reassessed, but I think that that time has passed. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot more in that bill, I should say. There's so much more in that bill than just canceling cap and trade. Yeah. Um, and there's so much more room for climate action in Ontario. Uh, so that's that's something to think about as well. I know Keith wanted to say a few words. I also wanted to thank uh, all of our panelists and Dave for coming all the way from Ottawa, Dale for coming all the way from Ottawa. We will be sending around, and anybody signed up will be sending around the video that we've taken of this as well. If you want to just like watch it over and over and over again. <laughs> and Keith's uh, and going to say a few words about next steps for the CEA. Um, yeah, all, all, all I wanted to say is that we have a habit of, of getting educated on topics for a reason. And so this is what we did last time carbon pricing was coming. We got educated about it and we moved towards taking a position on it and, and doing some work we could to support it. So. Uh, this is, I think, the first step for the CEA. We had a meeting a little while ago where we kind of said, who understands the output-based pricing system? And one person's hand went up. <laughs> so this was in part a response to that. We want to educate ourselves on it so we can understand the impacts. But also, as an alliance, we got to think about how we want to respond to these changes, how we want to inform them. And, I mean, we want to be, we are an organization that came together to support climate action in Ontario. We need to continue to do that. And there's our aspects of of the climate policy in Ontario that we can inform in terms of what is the provincial government going to do. There's pieces of work we can do to support the federal uh, government coming through and, 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 and using their carbon price in Ontario. And then there's a huge question around the revenue, right? It's $2 billion in 2019, rising to $5 billion in 2022, even if rebate checks are, are expedient. Uh, and you're going to get them in the year one. We, there's an opportunity for us to push for program spending down the road and for the government maybe to recapitalize some of the programs and municipalities lost and, and all that kind of stuff. So we already have a bunch of principles around carbon pricing. Uh, I think we're going to recirculate them, but I, I'd like to have a conversation about what we can do as an alliance to kind of continue pushing in the direction we've been pushing for a long time. That's it. Thank you. Right, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Uh, you've got to drink it on your way in, so I encourage you to head over to the bar, grab uh, a few like and have some snacks. Are you pissed off? Let's go. Yeah. Try that. Ah. Well, that's just pasta, right? Sarah, yeah. how do we stop the webinar? Oh, yeah. Uh, Not intuitive. Let's see if I can remember here. This? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.